my real great pleasure now to introduce what may be uh, perhaps our favorite panel of the whole conference. We've been doing this now for four years, and this is The Unmentionables. And here she is uh, from her day job, which is something like chief visionary and chairman of the board at Eliza Corporation. But her real job is, you know, thrilling us all in the world of American healthcare. Uh, the queen of the unmentionables, Alexandra Drain. Alex. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. So I think the only thing um, likely that is more nerve-wracking than standing up here um, right now is standing up here knowing that many of you have, many of you have this expectation that the unmentionables panel is going to be 90 minutes of insanity and crazy business and naughty things. Um, I just wanted to remind people who were here actually four years ago when we got started that when Susanna did her first part of the panel, um, what she talked about actually, what she said was specifically, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I'm intrigued that over the last three to four years, that has somehow been translated into research sex, talk about sex, have sex. And I will own that absolutely this is a part of the unmentionables, but ladies and gentlemen, it's not the entire thing. And so we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about sort of the whole arc of the unmentionables, of which this is certainly a component, and we will take this diversion. But what we really want to talk about today is something that I think has been a theme for many of you, certainly in a lot of what we've been seeing over the last day and a half, but the concept that health is life, care, absolutely, and empathy, always. So why do we keep coming back to this concept, and why is this the, something that a number of us seem to care about so ferociously? Well, it's based on a couple things. The first being that for most people in the healthcare industry, it's a very mission-driven thing, right? We're doing this because we passionately believe in it. We really want to make a difference in people's lives. We want to influence these headlines and help people be healthier. And in this crowd today, there are a number of people who have shown that they can influence that. If you could take a specific goal or a population, in fact, you can bend trend and make an influence. But a theme of the unmentionables over the last four years has been this very sobering realization that this slide of headlines, which again is for many of us why we do what we do and why we get up every day, we could have shown the exact same slide 20 years ago, and if anything, it would have been better. So one interpretation of that is, although we're all working very hard to make a difference to influence health, maybe we're not having the impact that we want to. So at ELISA, we became obsessed with this question, and I'm going to run through for you really quickly the origination of some of the, of the research that we were doing, and then show a lot of the new stuff that we've been uncovering over the last year. So when we reach out to individuals over whatever medium, we've done that over, we've got over a billion interactions now, a recurring theme is when we say to somebody, hey, go take care of your diabetes, or go see your doctor, or get a mammogram, or get a colon cancer screening, very rarely does somebody say, um, I'm not going to because I don't believe in it, or I'm not going to because I don't care. What they say is, oh, I would love to do that, but I can't, because my husband just lost his job, or I'm caring for an aging parent. And so what we came to believe is that maybe, while well, these are the traditional health challenges, problems, that most of us are used to focusing on, perhaps, in fact, at least additionally, if not maybe most importantly, these are the diseases that we should be spending time on. Things like being a caregiver, financial stress, not getting enough action, having too much to drink, right? Maybe these are some of the underlying reasons that we're not bending that trend as much or as quickly as we wanted to. This is also something we, we were, we're all tracking, I'm sure you guys are feeling this also, very well summed up by Brene Brown, who is a woman who's been um, gaining, gaining popularity for obvious reasons, and I think she summed it up well when she said, over the past decade, I've witnessed major shifts in the zeitgeist of our country. I've seen it in the data, and honestly, I've seen it in the faces of the people that I meet, interview, and talk to. The world has never been an easy place, but the past decade has been traumatic for so many people that it's made changes in our culture. And many of us see this, right, in the headlines around us. And we put this slide together a while ago, and we don't have the heart genuinely to keep updating it, because you could just keep updating it. And we see the combination of these two factors, both the life challenges, the real-life events that happen to folks, coupled with perhaps we're living at a time that, it, that feels unusually hard, play out with individuals. And this is a comment that we got from one woman who we were reaching out to speak with her about her diabetes, but we have tens of thousands of these, literally. 
She said, when one gets tied up with taking care of another family member 94 years of age, energy goes there. And I'm going to have to balance this out because I will lose too. I'm so glad I followed up on the call. I'll do both of these. I will talk to my doctor and I will follow through. And yes, I know I need some help in the diabetes area. I really have to pay attention to this. This is ridiculous. I don't want to go down any further. So that was the kickoff um, to what has been now a reasonably exhaustive research process that we partnered with, with Wendy Lynch Maltarum, who will come up and share um, some really interesting data very quickly. The first thing we want to do is check and see whether or not these issues were true for people and what was the prevalence. So what you're looking at right here is demographically significant, um, statistically significant, demographically representative. When we asked folks, are any of these unmentionables, which are down the left side of the, sli of the slide, true for you, 95% of people said yes to at least one, and 40% said between four and six. The next thing we wanted to get at was to see what the literature says, which is these things influence health on a very single string basis, well, holistically, collectively, were they impacting health? And what we saw was people who reported having four or five unmentionables were over five times more likely to report bad health. And the reverse was true. We also saw the presence of something that we've come to call magnifiers, which you can think of as negative coping factors. So when something bad happens, these are the behaviors that can serve to sort of spin you down further. I'm sure most people in the audience, I know this happens to me, you know, I'll get in a snit about something at work, I got home, I have three glasses of wine instead of one, then I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and my mind starts racing and I'm having an argument with myself and then I don't sleep and then I'm depressed and this cycle goes on. We also know people who, when bad things happen, they appear remarkably resilient. And you can think of these as positive coping factors. And the literature refers to these things as um, as the top three in our research supported this as well, a strong network of peers, a strong sense of spirituality, and exercise. And originally we thought the exercise thing was kind of bunk. It turns out to really be true. And it doesn't mean you have to go to the gym and work out for an hour. It just means that when you're really strung out in that moment, just get up and move around a little bit, and that's really important for your body. What was interesting that we weren't smart enough to look tease out, but Wendy did, was it was the balance of these two things on an individual basis that was most predictive. Specifically, if you had a high ratio of bad coping factors to good coping factors, you were that much sicker. So we took this out to a lot of our partners who are big health plans, big PBMs, big delivery systems, um, big employers, and said, what do you think about this? Isn't this so cool? And most people said, we, we do. What are you going to do about it? And we said, we don't know yet. We'll get back to you. So we kept, came back and we kept noodling on this concept, like what does this mean and what does this represent and what do we do about it? And the word vulnerability kept coming up. So we decided what if we could do an index that would let us actually lay out a population in a world of limited resources where we could better understand who's really having some of these challenges. But we had to figure out of these unmentionables which we should include. So two didn't make the grade. We shared this with you guys last year. The two were sort of the blue elephants in the corner. One is sex because for the most part people felt that the, this industry is not ready to talk about that. And the other being job stress, and that reason being, you know, most of the employers that we talked to said, we know that everybody hates their job. There's just nothing we can do about that, so we don't, wanna, we don't really want to ask them about it yet. So the vulnerability index became an algorithm that looks at the balance of three things. One, the presence and magnitude of these life challenges, specifically to start caregiving, financial stress, and relationship stress, against your personal sort of resiliency factor, your balance of positive to negative coping factors, and what we showed was that you can, in fact, lay out a population. And it doesn't really matter what you put down the y-axis, no matter what, people who are highly vulnerable are having a harder time. So this is where we left you last year. Wendy's going to come out and explain to you what we've now seen that we have claims. We've gone live with a number of partners across the country and across the delivery system. And I'm just going to show you a couple other um, things that we've seen before she does that. So a couple things. The first is it does appear that there is a lot of vulnerability out there. The second thing is that even within what we would consider a homogenous population, let's take, for example, the commercial population, the first four that you're looking at are all employers, there's still variability in vulnerability. And as you go across to the right and you see that vulnerability is getting higher and higher and higher, you're looking at a Medicaid population, a dual eligible population, and then a population that we looked at for something that the government was interested in. The other thing that we saw, I'm sure some of you guys have heard about the U-shaped um, satisfaction curve, which basically says that we all go along in our lives happy, 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 and then we sort of hit our 30s and we have this terrible trough, and then we sort of wallow around miserably for a little bit, and then we sort of climb back up in our 60s. So the idea being that the middle of your life is sort of a marker for life kind of sucking. So we thought, well, vulnerability is probably a marker for that. So what if we reversed the happiness curve and called it the unhappiness curve and to check to see if we saw that same pattern with our vulnerability data? And in fact, we did. 
when you look, you see the same pattern across the board that the middle of life appears to be causing people a harder time. Also, we know that the middle of life is um, sort of when a lot of things happen. For example, the sandwich generation. More and more of us are caring for children and also caring for aging parents. And that's an enormous burden and can be very isolating. Traditionally, we've thought of caregiving as largely a female responsibility. A couple of interesting other things that we saw in the data refute that. Specifically, in the Medicaid population, more men are reporting issues with caregiver stress than women. We also saw that, um, counter to what we expected, we thought maybe men would not share as much about this, or maybe, in fact, they were handling stress better. Au contraire, men in the Medicaid population reported higher vulnerability overall compared to women. The idea of cultural disparities is not a new one, so this is probably something we expected to see, and I would imagine you guys would expect to see, that people who are speaking Spanish, Mark or probably for being Hispanic, um, in fact were highly vulnerable to a reasonable extent. And for all of us in the audience, many of us live in urban areas, and probably I know I spend a lot of my time tearing my hair out. Um, in fact, those who live in urban areas are high, more highly vulnerable and having a harder time. Vulnerability appears to also influence the way that you interact with the healthcare system. So you can imagine increasingly why all these things matter, because if you're trying to do population health management, if you're trying to build a relationship with people, if you're trying to build rapport, understanding what might be driving their behavior and understanding what that result of that might actually be influencing. For example, do I like my doctor? And what we see is that highly vulnerable individuals are less likely to have a doctor that they work well with, and as importantly, they're less likely to sort of follow the rules. They're less likely to go to a doctor who's in network. A question that we get asked all the time is, oh my gosh, this is so interesting, this is great, but there's no way people are going to answer these questions. There's no way. What we've actually seen is, in fact, they do. Not only do they, to the tune as you're looking there, of close to 90%, but in fact, the process of answering these questions increases satisfaction. So this is an average satisfaction rating from ELISA for the dual eligible population, which typically is around 72%. And when we added in vulnerability, it went to 94%. And we've never, ever seen a statistic like that with a dual eligible population. And what we heard anecdotally from individuals was, thank you for finally asking me about the things that matter to me. I'm so grateful to be able to answer these questions. And so what is it that's at the root of that 72 to 94 percent difference? Well, it's a, it's a principle that's very fundamental to good design, which is this concept of empathy, right? The vast majority of people out there are not not taking care of themselves, not doing the right preventive things, you know, ending up with diabetes because they want to or because they're cavalier or because they don't care. They are because they don't have an alternative because their life is hard. And so what we're all trying to do, which I know we are, is design products and solutions that actually influence people, engage them, seduce them into taking better care of themselves. We need to have empathy first. Now, just in case that's not, not enough of an influence for you, I'll share, um, you know, we looked at this because it was a, this is the number one design tenant from Apple, actually. Um, but I know if we took this to most of our customers, they would sort of pat us on the head and be like, it's great that you care about empathy, but I care about risk and cost and disease. So I'm going to bring up um, Wendy Lynch, um, who most of you know from last year, who's from Altarum, and she is going to come out here with Alyssa Eppel as well. Wendy's going to talk about um, what we saw when we were able to get claims back from these populations and how vulnerability is influencing that. And then Alyssa's going to talk about the, um, the manifestation of stress on our health and how it's actually influencing it. So, ladies, come on out. Thank you, Alex, for having me. Um, a little bit about my background, it's helpful when I'm supposed to be um, the official uh, representative of the geeks and nerds. Um, my background is that my father is a theoretical nuclear physicist and my mother is a um, biochemist. My brother is a junior chess champion. So what that means is I had no hope of having any fashion sense um, <laughs> ever. <laughs> Um, I compensate well by wearing black, black, a splash of something else, and black. Um, although I did hear from Alex that sometimes black doesn't go together, so um, I'm not quite sure what, what we're going to do. I, <laughs> I, do, I do think that when they map the human genome, and I know there are people here who do that, um, when they do the behavioral part, um, a 
a, a, a joy of math will be right next to the preference for sensible shoes. And uh, we can tell from this um, group today, and you, you watch, because I've done an informal survey, um, I probably like math the most um, <laughs> of anybody. So it is my job to be the nerd and to give you the data, so I will do the best that I can. Uh, when the project started with um, the team at ELISA a few years ago, what we were interested in is how life affects health and what aspects of life make things worse and better. And so we started by asking some questions uh, regarding these obstacles and the balance of magnifiers and buffers, which Alex told you about. And we said, so compared to other self-reported factors, how does vulnerability affect a person? And what we found from the self-reported data is that when somebody is uh, less vulnerable, they think life is good. When somebody is more vulnerable, they may only think life is good on the weekends. Uh, it's two out of seven days. When we ask them about the uh, self-reported health, what we found is that the VI is predictive of self-reported health far and away more than somebody saying they had a certain number of diseases or whether they had uh, markers on consumer data. We did take a look to see if vulnerability was just a proxy for something else. And so we measured BMI and income, and we looked at age and gender. And those things are not that associated with vulnerability. So it isn't just a proxy for something else. So when we got claims data and were able to look retrospectively, what we found is that there are quite a few different types of conditions that are associated with vulnerability. And it's all of these body systems. Doesn't matter whether it's mental health or immunity or back pain or, met or um, diabetes, um, gastrointestinal, it does seem that these things are associated with being more highly vulnerable. So as examples, you had five times the likelihood of having a mental health claim, almost three times as likely to have a back pain claim, and two and a half times as likely to have a diabetes claim. What we're not saying is that it's causal. What we're saying is there is an association between life factors and health factors. And because there are health factors involved, there's also cost difference. So individuals at the highest end of the spectrum controlling for age and gender have $4,000 higher average healthcare costs and almost four times as high of a likelihood of being in the top 5%, which those of you who look at claims know that those people account for half of all healthcare costs. So the other thing that we did was uh, we had the blessing of being able to look prospectively. It's one thing to look in the rear view mirror and it's another thing to be able to look forward. So after people took the vulnerability index, we looked six months prospectively and just finished this analysis recently. And what we found was similar results. Mental health, a much higher likelihood, back pain, a much higher likelihood, as well as diabetes. So in addition, we wanted to see what the type of claims would be. And so utilization, what is that like for people with higher vulnerability? And again, what we see is that it's not just primary care, it's not just inpatient care, it's all across the spectrum. So a higher rate of claims, meaning a higher cost, higher rate of high cost, 5%, a higher rate of how many prescription drugs by threefold and more, also a higher rate of being admitted to the hospital. So what we're seeing is this pattern of uh, increased care, a pattern of increased utilization. And so the next things that we'll be looking at that you can stay tuned for in the next year is the degree to which different aspects of vulnerability predict cost and whether vulnerability matters within a, a disease. And the sneak peek is that even within diabetics, a population that has diabetes, um, higher vulnerability is associated with higher cost and also in our quick look at how caregiving by itself affected costs, and you'll hear more about this, um, we have a higher rate of um, expenditure for people who have particular obstacles and particular magnifiers. So that is your geek update for the day. Uh, I appreciate your attention, thank you.
Miss Wendy. It's fascinating. Um, I'm Alyssa Eppel. I'm a, re a stress researcher. I'm a professor at UCSF. And I'm going to talk to you about stress and the good and bad of stress. And of course, the goal is to shift stress from more of the bad to, to more positive stress, where we can actually use stress to help us think better and problem solve better. So how does stress get under the skin to affect health? You just saw some dramatic data. I mean, this is huge variance accounted for. We never find this in our predictive models with single variables. So being vulnerable, having all, all these multiple stressors that wear you down, is getting under the skin to cause worse health. How does that happen? So think about, let me ask you about how we age. What do we, we have to, un to understand stress, we have to understand the basic fundamental building block of aging. So think about your own age. Do you feel like you are younger than your age? You don't have to raise your hands. Do you feel like you are, look your age, or do you feel like you might look older than your age? So what we know is that aging is elastic. It doesn't follow the chronological clock. Biological aging is, depends on many factors, and some of us tend to age in dog years. So what does that mean? If we age in dog years, I'm sorry to have to say this, but in dog years, I think you're already dead. <laughs> Not good. So we really need to understand the drivers of aging. And let me tell you, let me just summarize up 10 years of research on this pathway of, of understanding where stress meets aging. So one of the things that has been very helpful in understanding aging is some very basic fundamental research about how cells age. Cells age in part because these tips of the chromosomes, those little golden caps made up of DNA-based pairs and proteins, those are really sensitive and fragile, and they wear out as they are sensitive to the biochemical environment. They're sensitive to stress within our cells and within in our body, that stress hormones, oxidative stress. So this is a limiting factor on the cell's life, and it also predicts early disease and longevity. So when these telomeres, these caps at the ends of our chromosomes, get too short, it predicts the range of diseases of aging. So to sum it up, over the last 10 years, there have been a tremendous number of studies from our lab at UCSF to internationally showing that different types of suffering, the whole gamut, stress, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, domestic violence, exposure to bullying, these all are associated with shorter telomeres. So that's pretty depressing. That's what we call toxic stress. That's chronic stress. That's, pretty, that's about years of exposure, caregiving, work stress. So the question is, can we reverse this? How do we, we're all inevitably exposed to stress throughout our life, that's part of living. How do we prevent it from becoming toxic? Well, there are many different places to intervene, and I'm gonna talk about um, intervening at the beginning of life, but let me first talk about what's probably more relevant to all of us here is, here we have this brain, and some of us are more entrained to respond to stress in this exaggerated way. It causes all this wear and tear, people who are more vulnerable. Um, so the reversal process in, in, in the studies that we're doing and many of the different stress reduction types of interventions are really working on changing us from having the stressed state of mind where our limbic system is activated and we, we're really hyper aroused for much of the day to a state where we're activating our thinking brain and we can problem solve better and we can see things as more challenging than threatening. It's a creative process. So, we're doing lots of interventions. I'm going to tell you briefly about two. One is we're focusing on families, parenting stress. It turns out that when there's hard economic times, parenting gets worse. There's more uh, poor, poorly skilled parenting as well as um, unskilled parenting that puts kids at risk of child abuse. And so we're really focusing on parents, both parents of children with autism and parents of, of what we call neurotypical children, but believe me, they're, they're very stressed as well. And so we're looking at whether going into the family can reduce stress in the parents, in the parenting style, and in the kids, without even treating the kids. So we know that, that conflict between couples affects kids. Kids with special needs also create more stress in the parents. And what's the result of chronic stress, years and years of chronic stress? Depression. The num one of the most costly conditions in the world in terms of costs to our economy, major depression. 
So the other piece that I wanted to tell you about that I feel like is we, we can't talk enough about, we all need to be aware of this, is that stress starts during development. And we now know that there's intergenerational transmission of stress. So the developing fetus, the brain, is sensitive to stress in the environment. And that means if a mother is financially stressed, depressed, poorly nourished, these are all shaping the baby's brain to be more stress reactive throughout life. So what we're doing at UCSF is intervening. We're taking low-income, obese, pregnant women, and we're training them in self-regulation so that they're not overly stressed and having a big stress response every time something happens. Mindful eating, mindfulness training. And what we have found, this is an example of one of our cohorts of women, is that the women who tend to show the bigger reductions in stress have babies that come out less stress-reactive in their temperament and less uh, with less excess adiposity. So uh, this is one promising area of intervention. So I've shown you that stress affects us from the cellular level to the family level, and that we can use these telomeres as markers of stress, kind of biomarkers, are our interventions working? We can try to use different types of mindfulness training or brain training to shift our own personal stress response so that we're not uh, wearing out our telomeres and the rest of our body, and that we can have better relationships and live better. Um, and of course, the family level and the um, intergenerational transmission are also, also areas where we can intervene. We need all of our efforts. Stress is such a huge impact on health, and it's mostly off the map. And so I think that the work that Liza is doing and that you're doing is tremendously important. And you guys are the innovators and are gonna, going to be improving health way before healthcare system figures this out. So let me just tell you an example of what we're doing, piece of our intervention. We are, I saw many, many cool apps today. And so let me just set your expectations up right from the start. This is a, more of a academic app. This is not a commercial app, so it doesn't need to be highly technical. This was funded by Hope Labs, and this was a seed grant to basically say, how do you get into someone's day and promote mindfulness? So let me show you um, what our app does. We call it HEART, or Health and Resiliency Training. And so people are pinged during the day when they're stressed, either through passive monitoring of physiology or through their self-report. And they're given a very short exercise to reduce stress. And, and we call it you know, a quick sync. We don't want them engaging with the app. We want them to be fully engaged in their life. So I'd like you, for the next few seconds, to try this. This is what we do to reduce stress. We don't push it away and say stress is bad. We actually help people just be in the moment wherever they're at. And that, is, that works a lot better than suppression and avoidance. So wherever you're at in your chair in this moment, feeling your feet planted on the ground. Just take a minute, close your eyes if you'd like. Feeling your breath supporting your whole body automatically, naturally, no control is needed. Feeling your body just as it is in this moment. You can feel it against the seat. You can feel your feet against the floor. Breathing with everything. just as it is in this second. And that's it. You can press done. And you have changed your physiology. You've changed your breathing. You have shifted the blood flow in your brain so that you're able to see things uh, in a more as they are rather than a threatening way. So uh, I think a lot of our stress reduction is misguided because it gives the message that stress is terrible and we need to push it away and be happy. It doesn't work. So I think the acceptance-based methods are, are what we're, we're testing, and we'll need all the help of some of the, what you guys are doing with your passive monitors and your technology. Thank you so much. It's been fun to be here. Thank you, Alyssa. That was incredible. So some of you guys remember um, a couple years ago when Raman Bastani, who at that time was the CEO and founder of a company called Cupid Me, came on stage and talked about his app. And it was a moment that I think people were like, oh, that's cool technology, but they also laughed. They're like, when we talk about the unmentionable, you know, 
Cuban knew was about STDs. And they said, that's the ultimate unmentionable, of course, that will never, ever happen. Well, two things. One, I'm about to read you the introduction that Raman wrote for himself, because I'm just not this clever. Um, but before I do that, I want to say that Hula, which is the new name of Cupid Me, has partnered with the LA Unified School District, which is the single biggest district in the country. Um, and they're using Hula to teach kids age 12 and up about making healthier decisions. So this is an example of something that we're all like, that's never going to happen, and it is actually happening. So Hula, formerly known as Cupid Me, is an unmentionable success story from a few years ago. You may remember Raman's story. He went home with a girl he'd met at a bar. He asked if she'd been tested, and then she slapped him in the face. Hula solves that problem while making getting tested for STDs suck less. Raman has spoken at the National Library of Medicine, Stanford, gotten grilled by Mike Huckabee, and is probably, this is very important maybe for some of you, the safest person to have sex with in America, <laughs> given how often he gets tested. He promises to show everyone in the audience how to unzip safely before getting laid. Please put your hands together and welcome Raman. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's a true story, <laughs> and it never gets less awkward. Uh, in trying to find a solution to not getting slapped in the face again, uh, I quickly realized this is a much, much bigger problem than the one I had that night. Uh, 20 million people get an STD every single year, and it's costing our health care system about 20 billion per year. And I'm thrilled to show you all an iPhone app that we put out a couple days ago um, that has a radically different approach that's put together by our incredible team. Now, there's three different things I'm going to show you uh, in our app. Uh, the first thing is we have a testing locator. And think about it like Yelp, except for the best places to get tested for STDs. And what we do is we click on My Test Centers, Find Test Centers, and it will zoom in exactly where you're located. And then you can actually have different filters based on whether or not you want free services. Uh, maybe you want to see if they accept insurance what your community focus is, maybe you're LGBTQ, maybe you're younger and you want to figure out the right places for you. Once you do that, you go back, and then you have a list of the best places for you to actually get tested. Now, if you click on one of these locations, you're going to see a picture of it. You're going to see that it's actually open now in this particular case. You can click on the center details. You'll see the different hours of operation they have, and you'll also be able to see what the waiting times are in the future, and we're also adding reviews on these different places so people can figure out the right places to go. We'll also have what tests they provide. Do they give you the one minute rapid test or are they going to draw blood from your arm and it'll take a couple days to get the results. Now this information that you guys have all seen is not from the CDC. There's no API for it to this point. We actually hand curated this list across the entire country because the data out there for finding where to get tested sucks and we knew we had to actually do this ourselves. Now, once you actually find a test center and get tested, a lot of times your doctor will tell you, hey, if you don't hear from us for two weeks, no news is good news. <laughs> we think that sucks, and we're going to help you get your records online. So what you would do in this case is you would click on Get My Results Right From The Location. Uh, you would use your finger to actually sign on the iPhone, and you'd click on Send Your Request, and a HIPAA authorization request form goes to your doctor through a, HIPAA, uh, a secure HIPAA message, and they're required by law to respond. If they don't, you as the user can actually file a complaint directly with the Office of Civil Rights and or leave them a negative review anonymously. Now, once you get your results, we want to help you unzip safely, as Alex nicely said for us all. And what happens is you have a zipper, and this is actually how you share your status with someone else. And you can zip it up and down, right? And then you reveal your status. <laughs> and in this case, you see a picture, you see my username, uh, you see what I was tested for and when I was tested. Now, this is important because it says I was tested a month ago. But what we're noticing is our users are getting tested more often because they want a more recent test date on their profile because it's helping them get a lot more action or getting laid more, right? <laughs> and that's behavior change. <laughs> Now, we talk a lot about getting laid because it's fun, um, because it works, especially about one of the biggest unmentionables there is. But if you really take a look at what we're doing, this is patient engagement. This is patient empowerment to get their records, right? This is helping people make better data-driven health decisions, and it's actual behavior change, all in this tiny little screen that's pretty good looking. <laughs> now, look, this 
this isn't a medical problem; it's a social one. What we're doing doesn't look like health, it doesn't talk like health, and it certainly doesn't feel like health. It's fun, it's social, and it's what healthcare looks like in the 21st century.、Uh, please download Hula,、uh, unzip for us, and we'll make sure you get laid <laughs> today. I have downloaded Hula. I'm going to unzip it, and now I want to get laid. I'm disrupting the panel with the grace of my friend Alex Drain, because、um, I believe that health. Is not in the doctor's office, as our ex-surgeon general Regina Benjamin has said. It's where we live, work, play, pray, and have sex. She actually didn't say the have sex part, but it is where we live, work, play, and pray, and it's in the bedroom, and it's also in the kitchen. As、um, colleagues of mine at Healthcare DIY, which is a new health portal that we're launching a week from today, a week after the insurance exchanges. Launched today, and many millions of people did make calls today. I just saw on Twitter to the exchanges.、Um, what we believe at Healthcare DIY is that、uh, people have personal responsibility for their health and make decisions every day that bolster health, like the subjects that are in the unmentionables. But also, we added a couple new、um, elements in, our, in the survey that we did with consumers that we ended in late August. We asked people how much they cook at home, whether they go to church regularly, regularly on Sundays and have a spiritual life. We asked about hobbies and dancing and lots of things beyond typical surveys that talk about sex and other things. And what we found was a relationship between、uh, when people cook more at home—that means they're eating around the table—save、um, money regularly, the financial stress, sleep better, have a better,、um, more positive outlook. People also say they have better sex lives. And another thing that we learned that really would have helped the White House in marketing the health plan was that we found people who understood the Affordable Care Act better also had better sex lives. So <laughs> they should have called us, and we wouldn't have had the government shutdown.、Um, would have helped. So I want to keep bolstering this uh, health uh, message by introducing the next speaker. You can,、uh, because you're friends and family, you can actually go to healthcareDIY.com now and look at our health data story in the survey.、Um, let me just introduce our next、uh, speaker, Dr. Leslie Shover at the U,、um, the MD Anderson Cancer Center.、Uh, Dr. Shover is a clinical psychologist. She specializes in sex and intimacy issues. She's written a wonderful interactive guide called Hard Time. Times. Uh, don't、um, confuse it with the one by Dickens or Studs Terkel. Those are good, but hers is the more steamy version. So re- read hers. Anyway, Dr. Shover, welcome. Thank you. Well, hard times, cancer, and sexual health for men provides education, cognitive behavior therapy. And guidance on finding expert medical care for the over three million men in the U.S. whose cancer treatment leaves them with sexual problems. So, just to give you a quick view of the breadth of this website, you can look at our frequently asked questions, and you can see that we go over how different cancer treatments affect sex life, avoiding problems, getting professional help. And different kinds of problems like erection problems, desire, orgasm, pain. We also go over the basic facts about male and female sexuality, and we talk about the health of relationships, and we even talk about dating after cancer. But to show you this website, what I'm going to do is I am going to change hats, although I don't have a hat. And I am going to be the wife of a man with prostate cancer, who is seeing this website for the very first time. My husband Hal and I have been married for six years, and at first they were the greatest years of my sex life. But two years ago, Hal had radical surgery for prostate cancer. His surgeon said that he'd be probably good as new in a few months, but he never got his erections back. Now we aren't having sex at all. 
So my doctor said that maybe this Hard Times website could be helpful. And I want to see if I think I could convince Hale to look at it. I know he likes stories. Hmm, these guys look kind of young. Oh no, here are some our age, and it looks like several of them have had prostate cancer. So that's promising. Let me see, problems. Accurate expectations, that's something we sure didn't have about Hal's cancer treatment. And look at this. My doctor said everything would be okay. That sounds awfully familiar. And I wonder what this is, the crystal ball of erections after cancer treatment. Predicting your chance of good erections after cancer is a lot like looking in a crystal ball or listening to the weather report. Oh, I wish somebody had told us that. So it looks like there are lots of different kinds of problems here. Oh, look, there's even incontinence. You know, coping with urine leaks is really important. That's something we haven't even mentioned out loud, but I can tell you that's a big barrier for us in not having sex. Of course, Hal is all focused on his erections, and it does look like they've got a lot of different information here. Oh, here's a decision aid to help you and your partner make a choice about erection treatments. So let me see. Oops, went to the wrong one. Here we go. So if I look at this, it has a rating scale for partners. So I guess these are things that might be important to you about different treatments, like not taking away from spontaneity, being unnatural, few side effects, not cause physical damage. That's pretty important. I don't care that much if it involves ongoing expenses, but it should usually produce firm, reliable erections. So let's see if I submit. Oh, it gives me the top three treatments that might work for me. And I guess Hal would do the same thing and then we can negotiate, but I can tell you he's not gonna go for sex without erections. So here's a whole section for partners, I like that. Let's see, what's in hard times for me? That's a good question. Oh, here's a whole set of exercises I could try with Hal. I like that because I like taking action. And I saw that it said taking action, getting my partner to take action. Well, that's where I am. So it says make a date to talk together, okay. Start with the positive, tell your partner you love him. I do that every day anyway. Let him know your needs for affection and pleasure still count. That is something I haven't done and I agree, I think it's time. Tell him you want to work with him to make things better, okay? How could he say no? Offer him a sensual massage and set the scene to make it relaxing. You know, I've given Hal plenty of massages. I thought this website was supposed to be about my needs too. I guess no website is perfect. Thank you. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to bring out somebody who is near and dear to all of our hearts. And we heard from her a little bit yesterday, Susanna Fox. She's going to talk about um, caregiving. So we talked about vulnerability really being the balance of these things. One, the presence and magnitude of one of these things happening in your life, like becoming a caregiver, which I think anyone in this audience who's gone through it knows that it is an unbelievably isolating, incredibly difficult, um, actually does influence your health, twice rated depression. Um, Susanna's gonna talk about caregiving, and then we are going to talk about, and Susanna's from Pew, you all know that. Then we're gonna talk with Gabrielle Glazer. I don't know if any of you in the audience have seen her. She has been um, very present in the last year since she wrote a book. Um, and she's going to talk about substance use, specifically around women. So as we talked about before, so Wendy and Gabrielle, if you guys will come out and join me. Um, when times get bad, it appears more and more of us, I will admit this happens to me, go home and turn to self-medication as a way to deal with these life challenges. So Susanna, if you will take it away, do you need this? Thank you. I, I will take that. Thank you. So I talked to you a little bit yesterday about how we use data as a mirror in a window. And um, as I also talked about, um, when the public conversation goes one direction and what I'm seeing in my field work goes the other direction, then I know it's time to do a survey. So it turns out that caregivers, like trackers, the group that I talked about yesterday, um, are a group that we underestimate. Because unless you know 
where to look, you won't see them. And they also may not take on the title of caregiver because they just see themselves as a dutiful son or daughter, wife or husband. But that's why it's so important to hold a mirror up with data and to, to show them who they are. Um, because as this quote shows, um, this is, caregiving is something that's going to come to all of our lives. It's, it's a big part of our lives, and it's a big part of healthcare. The AARP did a study which showed that the estimated value of caregivers' contribution um, to healthcare in 2009 in the U.S. was $450 billion. And that's unpaid care, that's unpaid work. And um, so often these folks are invisible. Um, there's, there's not really a coalition um, of caregivers. And that's why I thought it was very important to update some of the data that we have. When we put the survey in the field, um, what I try to do with our research is I listen to the audio of the first um, interviews that we do. And that first night, we reached a man we were uh, surveying during the president, presidential election. And he was very hostile to the interviewer. He was very angry. He did not want to take another political survey. And she said, no, no, this is a healthcare survey. And as we um, started the questions, um, as the interviewer started the questions, his voice got quieter and quieter because he started answering the questions about the activities of caregiving. We never used that word. And it turns out that he is the primary caregiver for his elderly parents. And what our survey found overall um, is that nationally in the United States, 39% of adults are caring for either an adult, multiple adults, or a child with serious health conditions. Um, we um, found in 2010 that it was only 30%. So that's a very significant jump from 30% in 2010 to 39% in 2012. Now, this is a big demographic story. We can talk about you know, the aging of the population and the effect that's going to have on us. Um, it also is an economic story, as I talked about. Um, it's also, it also points to this growing burden that the healthcare system is placing on families as hospitals discharge medically fragile patients. And they go home very much in need of complex care. But today, I'm just going to focus on those men and women who are doing the majority of caring in this world. Um, they're doing the wiping, feeding and dressing, but also the medication, insurance, and appointment management. Uh, we found in our survey that caregivers are actually more likely than other adults to have faced a medical emergency of their own or been hospitalized in the past year. And Alex has asked, and I think it's right on, that um, should caregiving have its own diagnostic code? Um, and I think that there should be some kind of marker for caregivers, because so often they put their loved one first, and they don't get the care that they need. And that's going to continue to grow as the percentage of the population who's caregiving grows. Um, so as that reality sinks in, I wanted to share this picture, which became famous last year, um, along with a quote that you might have seen on Facebook. Um, and it's Mr. Rogers. Um, Here's the quote. When I was a boy, and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words, and I'm always comforted by realizing that there are still so many helpers, so many caring people in this world. Now, this picture was taken by uh, Jim Judkis, and the Washington Post printed a story about the little boy in the picture. His name was Tommy. Um, he had hydroencephalitis and Dandy Walker syndrome, which affected his um, balance and coordination. He was rejected by his birth mother at a very early age and adopted by a family who said that he was a blessing in their lives. They actively took on the caregiving. Now, I love this picture because it captures for me the love that Mr. Rogers would beam out through the television to me, 
personally, and millions of people on his show. And Tommy is beaming that love right back at him. And that is what I see in my field work with patients and caregivers. They are beaming love back to each other when they find each other, whether it's, whether it's online or offline. Now, um, someone recently asked me to name the most exciting innovation in healthcare today. And I think that he was expecting me to name maybe an app that um, is catching fire in the patient communities that I follow. No. I've said it before and I'll say it again, that the most exciting thing that's happening in healthcare is people talking with each other. <laughs> and the data shows that caregivers are more likely than other adults to seek peer advice and support. Again, it can happen offline or online, email, phone, or on a message board, and it can feel very basic and even ancient. Uh, not very sexy, unless you think that being human is sexy. I do. Um, what's new is that technology allows us to widen the network of people we can talk with, increase the velocity of those conversations, inject them with more source material than archive, and make them searchable. So this is my charge for Health 2.0. Look for the helpers, then help them connect with each other, give them a hand. We're all going to be there someday as caregivers or as the ones being cared for. Thank you. When I had my first daughter in 1992, the Cold War had just ended. Nelson Mandela was about to take his place as South Africa's president. And we had elected to the White House a man who, oh, this is my first time doing this. Um, we had elected to the White House a man who had a professionally successful wife, a first. When I got together with other mothers, of, also of young children, we went to parks. We went out for coffee. We went for walks. The world seemed like a really, really optimistic place. Nine years later, in, the November, in November of 2001, I gave birth to my third daughter. I lived in a small town outside New York, and we lost nine neighbors in the attacks on the World Trade Center. I brought her home in the middle of the anthrax letters. We had already all the baby stuff we could possibly need, so my friends didn't want to come see us empty-handed. And of course, we, we welcomed seeing everybody, but almost all of my girlfriends bought, brought a, along a very strange present. They bought, brought wine, a lot of it. And I wasn't even drinking at the time, so I chalked it up to the anxiety that everybody everywhere was feeling. But because I'm a journalist and I write about health and its intersection with culture, I started noticing just how intertwined alcohol was with being a modern woman. It wasn't just girls gone wild in Daytona Beach. It was young mothers who were on girls' weekends. It was middle-aged women with boozy book clubs. It was everywhere and it was us. I decided to write a book about the topic, and it didn't take me very long to confirm my observations with some pretty significant statistics. For one, in the nine years between 2007 and 1998, I reversed those numbers, sorry, women's arrests for drunk driving skyrocketed 30 percent. Men's rose only 7 percent, and this is in a, in a time period during which drunk driving arrests went down significantly. Between 1992 and 2007, the number of middle-aged women who checked themselves into alcohol rehab nearly tripled. I could go on with these statistics, but I think this one is one of the most telling. Last year, American women bought two-thirds of all the wine sold in this country 
and they polished off the majority of that. With all due respect to Sheryl Sandberg, women are doing a lot of leaning in, but it's mostly at the bar. There are a lot of reasons for this. Women are twice as likely to be diagnosed with depression and anxiety disorders. They're far more likely to have been suffered from eating disorders and be victims of sexual abuse. They're also far more likely to medicate unpleasant feelings with alcohol. In fact, researchers have discovered that when men get cravings for alcohol, they're triggered by images of their favorite drinks or their favorite watering hole. Women, on the other hand, are triggered by pictures of traffic jams and crying babies. The enrollment of women on college campuses also, takes, also plays a role. In, in the rise in women's drinking. The more educated a woman is, the more likely she is to drink. Part of this is due to the fact that the culture on college campuses, even though we have, women are now outnumbering men all across the country, the activities and entertainment, uh, uh, such as it is, are really male-dominated. We have frat parties, beer bongs, tailgating, um, dive bars, and girls start matching guys drink for drink. They carry this habit, speaking of drinking, um, they carry this habit with them as they go into their first jobs, especially also male-dominated fields such as tech, business, and banking, where it's really part of the culture to seal a deal with a client after work or to go out for drinks. And again, the women are matching the guys drink for drink. When they get, as they begin to age, they start to use alcohol as a real stress relief, particularly in isolation and at home. As many of us have spoken here today at this conference, we all know that women are delaying childbearing, so they're caring for young children at the same time they may be taking care of aging parents. You throw homework into that mix, you throw a relationship, your own career concerns and demands, and add to this this is something that I think is exceedingly important. Economists in our culture, have, uh, economists have studied, who study time use have found that middle-aged women are driving more than at any time in history. And the reason is very clear. It's because of children's activities that take place after school, that are private, and that take place on the weekends. Mothers do the majority of that driving. So we're talking about hockey practice, dance, and my personal pet peeve, travel soccer. <laughs> I think I just screwed up my slides. Um, talk about vulnerable. No wonder so many of us reach for wine the minute we head in the door. But drinking is one place where women and men do not have parity. Women have more fat in their bodies and less water, and fat absorbs alcohol, water dilutes it. Women also have uh, less of an enzyme called uh, alcohol dehydrogenase, which helps process alcohol. All these factors make women far more susceptible to alcohol's toxic effects. The big question when I was writing this book, which came out last summer, was how much is too much? And that is a really great question, because it depends on where you live. In the United States, Officials say one drink per woman per day, no more than seven drinks a week, or you are an at-risk drinker. In Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, France, and Australia, which also have grown-up healthcare systems, that number is double. In Spain and Italy, the number is triple. Interestingly, the life expectancy of women in all of those countries exceeds that of the United States. And I'm not, I mean, I'm only partially kidding here when I say travel soccer, soccer probably has something to do with it. Anybody who has been in those shoes will, understands how horrible that is. Um, <laughs> our puritanical approach to drinking, and there are a number of reasons why the U.S. has such a low, low daily recommendation for, for women, partly because of our car-driven culture, but our puritanical approach to drinking really sends a lot of women underground with their drinking. They start to hide it. They feel ashamed. 
In researching this book, I talked to hundreds of women, and I've heard from hundreds more since, since the publication, about how they, the extent to which they go to hide their, to hide their uh, drinking. How do women get better? The biggest way is by giving them power to take their own, their own situation into control. We have an abstinence and faith-based method here that is not successful. Its success rate is in the single digits. In other countries, people refer to alcohol problems as alcohol use disorder. That implies a spectrum. One thing that is exceedingly important and what I'm hoping that you innovators can help do, I'm a journalist, I work on paper. We have apps for meditation, we have apps for calorie burning, we have apps for, for diabetes monitoring. I would love for a way for women to be able to find a way to moderate their drinking, to identify their triggers, to come home and have a big glass of seltzer before they start opening the, the wine bottle. It can be done, and certainly in other countries, there, a middle way is found. Women don't want to have to stop drinking forever. They can find a middle ground. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. And I forgot to mention before, too, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. That Gabrielle, um, the book that Gabrielle wrote, which is amazing, is in the, I think we'll, there are um, copies which you'll be signing when we go out to the break okay. for, drink, for drinks. <laughs> <Yes>. Funny enough. <laughs> we can all toast Gabrielle, who just described my life. Um, so it's, you know, we're very honored, obviously, to have Susanna. You guys can oh, sit because you're going to stay with us. Yep. And Gabrielle. And I think Gabrielle is somebody you should all Google because we're less familiar with us with her, those of us who have been in the healthcare space for a while. Um, you can sit, you're good. Um, the other... Um, we heard there were drinks. <laughs> <laughs> we have somebody else, I'm sure you guys look, who's joining us today, who is new to the Health 2.0 community, and that's Jen Lim. She is the CEO and Chief Happiness Officer of Delivering Happiness, which is a company that she and Tony Shea, um, who's the CEO of Zappos, founded to inspire science-based happiness, passion, and purpose at work, home, and everyday life. She's been a consultant at Zappos from its startup days in 2003 to the $2 billion business it is today. Um, the Zappos Culture Book, which is one of her creations, is a global symbol of how companies use happiness as a business model to increase productivity and profitability. And this has now evolved from a book to a bus tour and a company and a global happiness movement that's been represented by people from 110 countries. So today, her job is to grow the delivering happiness movement so we can all pay happiness forward. forward. So we've been thinking about um, this notion of life challenges, this notion of negative coping factors, the things that bring us down, one of which is drinking. Um, and now we're going to talk about the things that bring us up and how we create buffers. So before Jen comes out, there's a video about delivering happiness that we'll just cue really quickly. Please welcome Jen. Hello, everyone. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but I think I can use a drink <laughs> right about now. Um, so it's a real honor for me to be here. I was actually, I usually don't speak at health type conferences, but um, so I was really excited to be invited to this one. Uh, I think I want to start, though. I mean, I was asked here to talk about happiness in the workplace and 
I know what you guys are probably thinking, like, why should I even care about happiness in the workplace? You know, I only spend most of my waking hours there. I only spend more time with them, my coworkers, than the people I actually love at home. So why does it really matter? So I at least actually would like to start to, with this um, by taking a poll. Um, how many in the room uh, know about Zappos.com or are customers of Zappos? Okay, cool. And then how many in the room uh, know about Delivering Happiness? First there was a book and now it's its own company that Tony, the CEO of Zappos and I co-founded. Okay, cool. And then how many in the room believe that you know how to predict your own long-term happiness in your own life? Okay, that's about average. If you look around, well, these are the happy crew. <laughs> It's really interesting because I, you know, I go around the world talking about happiness now, and what's so interesting is that everywhere I go, no matter where in the world, about one to five percent of the room raises their hand. And so I thought this was so interesting because here we are, you know, we're benefiting a lot from all the sacrifices that have been made in the past. Our ancestors did a lot to get us to this point in a global society, but yet we're still unhappy. And it's such not a, you know, a new thing. I mean, this guy named Aristotle, 200 BC, was saying, you know, the purpose of our existence is actually happiness. And what's even more interesting, he said that it's happiness is dependent on ourselves. So why is this the case? It's in our Declaration of Independence. Why can't we get there? So I started thinking about this. And so I just wanted to pull up some real world examples. We've got Renee on the bottom, oh, I'm sorry, the top right corner. She just received her financial statement from Merrill Lynch. <laughs> thinking, you know, I thought if I would stay for my 401k my whole life, I'd actually be a happy person. Unfortunately, this was not the case. And then on the bottom left there, there's Joe. He just got laid off from a job he actually didn't even like anyway. But seriously, though, for everyone in this room, I'd like you to ask this question, because I boil it down to why does this matter? It comes back to ourselves. Because if you think about it, if you ask yourself this question, like, what are your personal goals in life? What's interesting about this is no matter who you ask, I want to develop a successful practice, I want to be healthier, I want to have a family, no matter who you ask, you ask yourself why enough times, it usually comes back to the same answer. I want to be happy, or I want to make people in my life that I love and care about happy. So why is this the case then? When I want to caveat, when I say happiness, I talk about the science of happiness. So essentially, this is a relatively new field of study where research and data is going into understanding what is it that actually creates more happiness? Not focusing on what's wrong with us, but focusing on what's right with us and how to increase those levels of happiness. So the research says that we as humans are fundamentally hardwired to seek happiness in our lives, yet we are really, really bad at it. And we think about the stories we hear about lottery winners. We all remember and hear those a lot. You know, you would think their happiness levels will go up, but actually they either peter out or go down. What's also interesting is that the inverse is true, is that they, made, they did studies on people that lose uh, their sight or use of their limbs, and the studies show that happiness levels actually go the same or actually increase over time. So this is all to say we're really bad at predicting it, and we always hear either ourselves talking about it or uh, people around us to say, oh yeah, when I get this, I'll be happy. When I get that raise or when I get that whatever it is, I'll be happy. But it becomes a vicious cycle that never ends. So, I started reflecting on this a little bit because here I am standing in front of you and again going around the world talking about happiness, but yet I was not that happy-go-lucky person growing up, ironically. I was the one in high school with my Walkman on, listening to songs by The Cure, uh, reading books by uh, Albert Camus, The Stranger, uh, in French. You can't get much more glum than that, right? And I was just asking all these ex existential questions, like, why are we here? What is this all for? So I started reflecting a little bit as to how I got to this place. And so I reflected to the point where I started school. And, you know, I'm Asian American, um, living in the Bay Area. There's a lot of us here. And for whatever, whatever reason, there was three quintessential things to be successful in life. Number one was get into a good school. Number two was become a doctor or a lawyer. And number three was learn a variety of musical instruments. So for me, I thought I had it made. I got into Cal Berkeley, I was studying pre-med, and I had several years of piano under my belt. But when I started studying, I realized, you know what, this is actually not for me. And so I started wandering around, and I stumbled on this thing called Asian American Studies. 
And from that period, I started feeling like, wow, I was so impassioned by this topic. And so I called, and I, I decided to major, and I picked up the phone, called up my parents, and you guys exactly know what's going to happen the next scene, right? They completely freaked out and said, are you serious? We're working all these jobs for you and your brothers. We've made all these sacrifices so that you guys can have opportunities that we don't have. Your great, great, great grandpa, grandparents, sailed the Pacific Ocean in a tiny little boat and almost died so that you can tell us that you're studying yourself. <laughs> and I was like, wow,、well, they're really good at this guilt thing, but I stood my ground, I majored in it, and then I realized what they meant because I graduated and I couldn't find a job. So it was my turn to freak out. And from that point on, I started cold calling every company I knew, and luckily for me, the internet was born. I became an internet consultant at KPMG, and all of a sudden, as everyone knows in this room, it was the money title stats that fell in my lap. And all of a sudden, almost literally the next day, everything was gone. The dot com busted, and I got laid off. And I felt like a total loser, but not because I lost my job, but because I thought the money title status meant everything when it really meant nothing at all. So this is when in the book I. I decided to go climb a mountain. I, I chose Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. T- Tony decided to join me, the CEO of Zappos. And you can just imagine us. You know, here we are in our 20s, and our 20s. I just lost my job. He just sold his first, first company to Microsoft at about 280 million dollars. <laughs> Obviously, we were at the opposite ends of the financial spectrum. But it was interesting when we started working on this book. We realized we were thinking the same exact question, which was, what are we going to do for the rest of our lives where money does not matter? So I came back, you know, feeling, wow, this is great. We summited. It was just straight like out of a movie, and I felt like anything is possible. But then that moment happens, and it happens to everyone in this room, if not once, at multiple times in our lives. And basically, my life did a 180, and it felt like the rug was pulled from underneath me. And for me, it was great. It's facing my greatest fear, actually. And my greatest fear was being in a life and living without someone that I couldn't imagine life without. I lost my dad to colon cancer. And I'll never forget something、uh, the、uh, oncologist said, and I only said it to this、um, in, uh, this room here. But he said, you know, in reality, everyone has a terminal disease, if you really think about it. Yeah, he's a pretty happy-go-lucky guy, huh? <laughs> but it put me into that again, that that place where I had to face those questions that I was refusing to answer, which is, what am I going to do that's of meaning and substance every single day? And that's when I looked at life as a green field, and I started doing that. I was super passionate about. I started writing. I started doing graphic design. I started making films. And through that process, I realized if it wasn't the money title status, what was the most important thing to me? The values in my life were guided by the people around me. And through that process, I stumbled upon a tiny little startup named Zappos. And all I wanted to do was just sell the most shoes in the world. But then I grew up, and I said, you know what? We actually want to focus on customer service first. Then I grew up again and said, you know what? Employee satisfaction and happiness, number one. Is is our purpose, and through that process, they understood that you know what what we're actually doing is not selling shoes. We're actually delivering happiness to the world. So fast forward a few years later, that's when delivering happiness was born. And so now the biggest question I get is, I just want to make a comment on this. Actually, the reason why I did this little funky little、uh, PowerPoint is because, in reflection of those ups and downs in my life, I realized what. Is basically the answer to that question of sustaining happiness and realizing you know, the values that were present or not present, or the people that were present or not present during those up and up and down times. So I actually invite you guys to do the same sort of exercise because it's really revealing in understanding what is it that makes us sustain our happiness. So at this point, people say, really, you know, something as fluffy as happiness be something that can be successful as a business model or organizational model. And I go back to the stats. There's a poll in 2011 that shows that. In the U.S. alone, 71% of our employee workforce are disengaged from the work, realizing that that means $300 billion are lost in productivity every year. So that's the challenge that I take for myself and ask for everyone in this room to think about: How do we change that so we turn disengagement into real engagement and productivity? So for me, the first thing I talk about, of course, is my background is Zappos, and I've been there,、uh, a consultant there for 10 years now. And here's just one example of a company that focuses on just two things: having a very strong company culture and having superior customer service. And through that process, they're now a two billion dollar company in gross merchandise sales, and they were sold to Amazon for 1.2 billion at the time of closing. But what's great is that it's not just Zappos doing it. There's other companies that realize if you focus on employee well-being, like this in the、uh, S&P 500, we did a comparison between you know the best workplaces versus those that don't focus on it. 
And it's consistently over the last 10 years, they've、uh, excelled over those that didn't. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about the science of happiness and what does this tell us. And one of the major studies that have been done, a lot have been around different sort of frameworks and how do we understand, you know, how do we increase our own levels of happiness? One of the first things is perceived control. Do we have a sense of control in our day-to-day -day decisions and are they being acted upon, whether it's at work or in life? A second thing is called this sense of progress, perceived progress. Are we growing? Are we developing? Whether it's in our career or in general life, in, in the way that we're evolving. One of the funny scenes that I remember from—do、um, you guys remember that movie with、uh, Eddie Murphy,、uh, Coming to America? And he just—you know—he's a prince. He never worked in his life, but then he found his goal. He found this woman that was the daughter of the manager of a McDonald's, and he said, "That's what I'm here for." for. So I remember that scene. I don't know if you guys, but when there was some people that was just starting work there, and he said he's standing there with his uniform, all proud, and he said, "You know what? Don't worry. You know, I was used. To, I used to be where you guys were today. Basically, I started in mopping the floors, and then I got to the lettuce station, and then I got to the burger station, and now I'm a cashier." And so all this in his mind is like he had this perceived sense of progress, getting to his goal. Never mind the goal was just to try to get to the manager's daughter's pants, but. The points being is like he knew he had something that he wanted to accomplish, and he was getting there step by step. The third thing, and this is very important in terms of sustainable happiness, is connectedness, and that's essentially the breadth and depth of your relationships, whether at home or at work. And the last, and this is actually the most essential one to remember, it basically answers that question I first brought up, which is how do we sustain our happiness? It's this idea of having a vision and meaning and a higher purpose, something that's bigger than ourselves. And a lot of people will say, "Yeah, well, it's my kids, it's my pets, it's my family," and I love that. I mean, that's so noble. But I challenge everyone to think about what else is there that will define us in that moment. Of if we are actually being true to ourselves, and through that process, we call it being true to our weird selves. Through that process, living out our passions, whatever they might be, kiteboarding, surfing, baking, whatever your passions are. And through that process, be able to develop this other, greater notion of what your higher purpose might mean. So for us at Zappos, it became sort of this aha moment because here we have the science of happiness saying a certain level of things, a certain number of things can increase our happiness. But an aha moment came on us at Zappos. Was like, you know what? It's actually in perfect parallel with what we can do to sustain our organizations and our businesses, because we all know that we need pleasure as individuals, and we all know we need profits as a business or a company. But what we believed and what we saw at Zappos and now other companies that unless you layer the passion and having that higher purpose. So that everyone in your organization can be inspired by, so that no matter what they're doing, how menial seemingly that job is, they're inspired to do it because they believe that they're doing it for a greater purpose outside of themselves. There's another book that came out recently by Sean Aker, and he did a lot of interesting studies on on happiness and how it works in the in the workplace. So his point is that you know it's not just something that we think about an afterthought; it's actually going to be a competitive advantage for us. And there's all these studies that are being done on neuroplasticity and how you can actually see that if you are operating from a more positive mindset or a neutral one versus a negative one, you're actually able to train your brain as muscle as it is in a way that will continue to reinforce that positivity. And so the thoughts that go behind this book is that it's not success that actually brings you happiness; it's happiness that actually brings you more success. And so. Outside of us in Zappos, it's what's great is like I woke up last week. I'm sorry, last year, to this issue of the Harvard Business Review, and essentially, you know, it's kind of weird seeing dollar signs at the end of a happy face. But basically, business people, economists, even the United Nations are seeing the economic value of happiness. And so we always talk about, you know, how do we retain our employees, which is actually not a word I like because it feels like it's imposed and it's not their choice. But the studies show that when you have a happy workforce and environment. There's less sick leave, there's less burnout, and there's less turnover, resulting in higher dollars. But what I like better about this, in terms of thinking about happiness in the workplace, is the term engagement, because you're flipping it around. Because it becomes a choice of your employees, because they want to be there. They're actually want to excited for Monday because they want to see their friends. They're so engaged with your coworkers, or they're engaged with your、um, task at hand. 
and ultimately, they're engaged with your higher purpose. And that studies have shown is that you increase your sales, you increase your productivity, you increase your creativity, and no matter what kind of metrics that you're trying to measure for your particular department or organization, your higher employee engagement and happiness uh, pretty much uh, leads to higher optimization and efficiencies and engagement at work. So this is what we do now, delivering happiness. We actually consult and talk to companies. And what I say is like, we like to suck the fluffiness out of happiness because we want to measure it and make it quantifiable. So we actually partnered with this guy named Nick, Nick Marks, and he uh, developed a happy business index. I'm sorry, a happy planet index. That's a pretty popular TED talk a few years ago. And so we developed within a happy business index. So essentially what we do is we can go into organizations and help them frame their own DNA and their culture that's specific to what they are. Because we never say, let's try to be a Zappos or just try to be an Apple. It has to be specific to your own employees and what your vision is. And through that process, we correlate employees' happiness as individuals to the productivity and efficiency of that department or uh, the organization. And so what's been great is that we've understood that it, it can be applied outside of what we were typically used to, uh, to work at. So outside of Zappos, we've gone to other different kind of industries, and no matter if it was a nonprofit or a TV producer, they've been able, able to apply these things. So now I ask you and challenge you in thinking how maybe, if this is what the studies show, how might that be applied to your own, own organization or your individual life? And so Shifting gears again, going to this whole thing called delivering happiness, what was amazing to see is that after the book came out, it's actually now in its 20th language translation, we really felt like a tipping point out there because all of a sudden we started getting all these emails and stories from people that read the book and said, you know what, I'm actually going to do something about this. Whether it's a small change or a big change, it was amazing to me to see that you know, no matter where they're from, whether or not they're religious, whether or not they're working, it all came back to this whole resonance of, you know what, I think I can make a change, a fundamental change, based on prioritizing happiness in my life. So when the publisher asked us, you know, what are you guys going to do for your book tour after it came out, we said, we have no idea, but we know that every one of these emails are inspiring us to do something about it. And that's why we did this whole tour called Inspire and Be Inspired. So we actually uh, bought this bus uh, from the Dave Matthews Band, anyone? Fast? Yeah. Actually, we got it from the Dave Matthews Band bass player, so good to know everyone's doing well, everyone has a bus. And we just took it around, and basically it has 23 cities, three and a half months, and it was pretty crazy, though. It was like five or six events in every city, so it felt like we were planning for like 80 weddings at a time. Uh, so if anyone's been married 80 times, you know exactly what that feels like. It was amazing, but it was so exhausting. But with the biggest thing, there was the stories that came out of it. And uh, there's so many that I wanted to share, and I normally do, but for context of this forum, I'll share one that we uh, experienced in uh, Boston, and this is Boston's Children's Hospital. And so, you know, one of the best children's hospitals in the world, and, and they formed a culture committee right before we got there, and they said, you know, come talk to us, because why is it that we are obviously, like, we know what our passion and purpose is. We just want to keep kids healthy. So why is it that our employees are so unhappy? And so we just broke it down to the basis. We started talking about their core values, what were they, and whether they actually live by them, their culture, and how you have to really commit to it. Because we all know culture isn't having free Red Bull in the fridge or a ping pong table in the rec room. It's something so much more organic than that. And we started talking to them about how do you empower, especially your frontline employees, because they're the first people that that person, your customer, your patient will see. And how do you get them to feel that they own it? They own that experience, that they're able to do whatever they can in their power to wow this person that's coming through, knowing that they probably don't have a great state of mind, but they have that opportunity to change that by their actions. So anyway, we had this conversation, and they took us for a tour, and then we met this girl on the right-hand side. She, she just had a kidney transplant. And, but you wouldn't be able to tell, you know, because she was just so full of life, telling us stories of her surgery in excruciating detail. But it was, like, so exciting to see, because she was so, you know, big, big in life. And so we're like, oh, well, let's show her our stories, you know, maybe we can wow her and show us all our experiences. So we started flipping through um, iPad, that's Tony in the middle, he picked it up, and we started showing pictures of the, 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 um, the whole tour. And she just started getting more and more excited. And we're like, wow, she's really inspired. And she's like, oh my god, that is so cool. I love your iPad. 
So I guess you know Steve Jobs gets that vote of inspiration. But uh, anyway, um, I'll end it here. I just want to summarize a little bit. But if you guys have any questions, of anything in this might you know strike a chord in terms of how do you actually change what you're doing at the workplace or at home based on the signs of happiness and essentially have more productive, engaging lives. Uh, we're here to help. Um, and so here's my email. It's jen at deliveringhappiness.com. It's jen with two N's. If you'd like a copy of this presentation or a copy of the culture book, which is free that uh, we produce every year for Zappos, just shoot me an email with your mailing address and we'll have one off to you. But basically, I just wanted to leave you with this. Like, imagine this for a second. If everyone that we know actually can say that they're living by their true self, their true weird self, and on an everyday basis, living their values and their passion and their purpose. And by doing that, actually remembering to prioritize sustainable happiness, not just the fleeting pleasure, but sustainable in our lives. First, imagine that. And then I ask very simply to do. And it sounds easy, but if it was easy, we would have happy organizations and happy people everywhere. But sadly, it's not the case. Because this is my fundamental belief that if we all do this, we can actually create more change in the world than we ever thought possible in our everyday lives and our organizations. And who knew it would come back to that simple little thing we always knew about called happiness. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. That was awesome. Um, most of us are familiar with this. I don't know about you guys, but I found this to be such an incredibly inspiring campaign because anyone who's ever felt strange or weird, right, this sort of motivated us. Like, oh my God, it's okay to be different, right? This is a good thing. It was so empowering. And for anyone out there who's starting a company, who's building a company, growing a company, you know that what you need to find is crazy people out there, right? Like brave people who are willing to give your nutty idea a shot. So we think a lot at Eliza about how do you identify those people? How do we find the folks who will let us do something that has never been done before? Um, and understand that there'll be bumps and bruises along the way. So we've actually identified a process, and I want to show you the early indicator um, that somebody is different. If you look, I'm going to actually get a little bit closer, and then I'm going to ask the audience to guess who that is. Um, does anyone want to guess who that person is right there? That's actually Joan Kennedy. And so we have in our midst a genuinely crazy person who is brave, who has done a lot of stuff at Cigna, um, but really in past lives as well, to demonstrate that she's open to trying new technology. And what our community here needs is people who will give us a shot and let us try things out. So um, I want to introduce Joan. <laughs> so I have to say that I'm incredibly thankful and very, very happy, very happy that my mother's not here today because she would say, Oh, Joan, please close your legs when you are wearing a dress. And it's much more ladylike to keep your tongue inside your mouth. <laughs> so thank you, Alex. And um, it's very excited to be here today. Uh, so one of the things that I think is interesting about this panel and so exciting is that it's really sort of the culmination, the marriage of, of research and insights that we're learning about humans and also tools and activities that we're trying to get at, what Susanna Fox uh, charged us with yesterday, which is, so what are you going to do about it to make a difference? And we're going to show you a little bit of an intervention that we put together that we hope is getting at that. So I've been in healthcare for quite some time now and uh, have always been looking at how can we engage people better and how can we improve their lives and are there things that we can do to make a difference. And I came across Cigna and all the new things that they were doing and looking at their philosophy on consumerisms and, and where they're going with their GoU individual campaign. I thought, well, this could be pretty interesting. And so I joined there a little bit over a year ago now, and um, my first day just happened to be Dave Cordani, who's our CEO, and this is Dave in the picture uh, with one of the Achilles runners at the Disney Marathon. And um, he started out his, his um, offsite talking about a story that happened in his house. And one of their good friends came over and was sitting in their kitchen and just extremely stressed out. And her husband had a good job, but he was now being asked to relocate, and their two children who were both in high school were, you know, basically creating <laughs> mutiny on the bounty because they weren't moving in high school. Uh, she was also the caregiver for her 
elderly parents. They lived there, and caregiving in and of itself, as you saw from Susanna, is very stressful. There's lots of things that goes about doing that, and then trying to imagine doing that when you're moving away from your family was creating severe anxiety for her, and started to talk about that. And so it brings to life really what we were, t- what what we've been talking about with the vulnerability index, and starting to talk about how you could help. So then the story goes on to say, well, then she went to her doctor, right? And、um, her buffers in taking care of her stress had been shopping,、um, which she'd racked up some nice dollars on, and eating. So she basically had gained 20 pounds over the last year. And the doctor said, well, you know, you really need to address this. And so she's telling Dave and his wife, well. I thought I was doing pretty good. 20 pounds isn't too bad. At least I'm not drinking a bottle of wine a day. That's what I really wanted to do.、Um, but the point being, she's stressed, right? And that she is going to have to work with her stress、um, before she's going to deal with other aspects of her life. And we know from the prior conversation, we certainly don't want to mess with these guys because they take care of us day to day. We don't want to shorten their lives because we want to live longer lives. We also know that how we have been addressing and trying to understand health improvement、um, has been fractionated, right? We think about it in aspects of health, like diabetes or obesity, but that's not how we live our life. It's more complicated when we bring this all together. And can we get at this in a more holistic fashion? And then consumers. Want to be communicated with and and have a different experience with us. So can we rethink how we're communicating and make it more fun and interesting and engaging and inciting? Because that's what consumers are looking for and how we communicate about life. Not only do they want you to communicate with them differently, they want you to join in their life, right? Go into their communities and be part of solving their life issues, whether it's cure for prevention or diabetes, JDRF, whatever it is. That they've got life issues that they're looking at, and so Dave's call to action to us at that meeting was. Can you solve? Can you create, or can you come together and have a life solution, one consumer at a time? So I thought about that. I'm thinking, well, this is pretty compelling. I think about all the great things that the Vulnerability Index has been studying. It's been studying life and how do we get at it. And maybe there's a way for us to partner with the vulnerability work that's been done and the survey that was created, and take the programs that we have at Cigna, because we've got a lot wide array, not just medical. We've got life and disability and EAP services. And can we recreate something that is part of that life solution?、Um, and so we worked together to do that.、Uh, we took this out to our key customers, our clients in the market, and said, Would you guys be interested? Interested in partnering with us? We had really, really exciting, you know, feedback from a number of our employer groups. We chose three to work with, and so off to the races we went to try this sort of integrated approach. And what we did is assess the vulnerability using the vulnerability index, the things that you've been hearing about,、uh, of these folks. We reverse engineered our interventions, right? Because we're not going to start with health. We know that there's the people that are vulnerable are stressed out, and that's not where they want to start. They want to go ahead and start with things like,、um, how do I get financial services? What kind of planning am I going to do? So we said, well, why don't we take our EAP benefit, which is sort of this, like, you know, very scary, has a lot of stigma to it. But if you actually look at what's in it, there's financial planning, there's caregiving, there's caring for children. There's lots of services in there that we don't use, and how we can reverse engineer and start. With that, and, and then work on health when they're in a more comfortable place. And then obviously metrics and analytics, right? We have to measure what we're doing. We're sort of going into a different world of bringing sort of life solutions. And in order to understand what's working and not, we, we wrapped lots of analytics and metrics around it. And then we. Studied and analyzed and studied and analyzed, and our lovely friend Wendy Lynch spent quite a bit of time studying and analyzing with us on what worked and what didn't. And some of the key、um, outcomes that we saw. Oh, can we go back one? Thank you. Uh, is that、uh, participation in the program was very good? 80% of the people that took the vulnerability index completed it. Um, and of those folks, 30% of them had vulnerability issues that we needed to to work and address. 55% of those people actually、um, went into the intervention program. We're very excited about participating. And coming out of that program, we saw very high net promoter scores. People were very satisfied with it. We also saw very similar kinds of data and、um, sort of、uh, cost data that Wendy has been talking about. Five times the mental health、um, likelihood if you have vulnerabilities. Two times of having diabetes. Diabetes twice as likely to have low back pain. So clearly, there was sort of this combined approach. 
What we also learned, though, is that some of our interventions, the way we did it, worked really, really well for certain groups. They liked talking with the coaches. It worked well in that conversation.、Um, but for other kinds of vulnerabilities, we had lower uptake. And so we started thinking, well, why is that? You know, what just. And then we sort of said, "Well, aha, duh! <laughs> Go to your research. You know the answer to this.、Um, you know, we know through various studies that people, when they're talking about things they're uncomfortable with, whether it's financial, substance abuse, those kinds of issues, are probably less likely to talk to a doctor or a human, and would much be, be much more comfortable, as this study shows, about 25% of people would be more comfortable actually talking to a computer about those issues and engaging in a program that way." So we took that feedback and, and thought and said, well, let's bring a lot of our services online. Let's bring financial stress management. Let's bring caregiving. Let's bring mindful resources. We can bring that into that automated world and provide that to them. We can also. Bring、um, our sort of life solution approach online as well. We can bring this into the where they can take the surveys and be part of engaging in the program in this online world. And with that, we also want to make it fun and exciting, not make it so boring and make it interactive, right? So if you're aging for a care for an aging parent and you say yes, we can also serve up. Feedback and support along the way, right? So we know it's hard. We know that it's difficult. You're the unsung hero. Congratulations, and you're doing a great job. And we're here to help you. So that as they're taking the the survey, they're also getting feedback and support. And from that survey, we're able to say what is the best approach to. For that individual who has these vulnerabilities, is it working through the coaches? Is it working online? It's probably a combination of both. And how can we best serve that up to support the improvement in that person's life situation? So health is life, right? We talked about this. We talked about this with Alex a little bit earlier. But it's a component of life. It's not the end of life. It's not the, you know, it is a piece of what people think and decide about. And I think one of the things that I've really learned through this and would sort of be, I guess, my call to action is as we think about where we're going in the future, we think about the individual, right? And we all start to, whether we're in the health world or in the tech world, we start to say, well, I'll, I'll start to. You know, Dig away at this. I'll build some fitness apps. I'll help them with their with their fitness. I'll you know help them with their heart disease. You know maybe I'll see if I can help them with their health and wellness. And oh well now they have diabetes, so let's do a bunch of things on diabetes. And oh now they got to take drugs, so let's make sure they're adherent. And oh hey you know what? There's all these great things they can wear, and we can measure all about them. We got shirts. We got all these things. And all of a sudden we've created in good intent a fractionated solution to how people need to manage their life. It's much more complicated than that, right? We've got to integrate and bring this to this person who's stressed in a much more holistic and simplified fashion. So my my call to action is: think about the person, go back to the drawing board, and think about what Dave asked us to do. Find the life solution, one consumer at a time. It's not as easy, but it's going to have a much more meaningful result. So thank you. All right. So we're almost done. Um, just wanted to say a couple more things. Thank you.、Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you on a million levels.、Um, I, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the slide. This might be something when I was a strategy consultant way back when we looked at the slide a lot. And I think this is a slide that's great for this room. We call the slide the dark, long, dark night of the innovator. And I think it's related to the reality that changing the world is really, really hard. And there are days in it when you are so far from happy, and you are pretty sure that you are the stupidest person alive, and this is never going to work.、Um, but that's where the good stuff comes from, right? Really digging in and staying focused, and staying motivated, and believing, and just keeping at it over and over and over again. And one of the things that we say to ourselves at Eliza when we have these long, dark nights of the innovator is we remind ourselves, as dorky as it's going to sound, of how a pearl is made. A pearl is made because a little piece of sand gets into an oyster and it agitates and it creates discomfort and it sits there and it agitates and agitates and agitates. But out of that comes arguably one of the most beautiful things that nature creates, which is this pearl. So what we wanted to close with today is just reminding all of us that what we're working so hard to produce, the healthcare industry would have us believe, should be reversing these headlines, and that is important, absolutely, because it translates to ROI and、um, prevention, but. Let's remember what we've heard over and over again over the course of the last day and a half, and today that if we put ourselves, if we go back to the concept of empathy, and if we put ourselves in the lives of the people that we're all working so hard to serve, what we all want is just to be happier, right? What we want is to feel better. So, 
as we think about how do we work on what we're doing, how do we get folks to um, be in a better place, and and make a real difference in their lives. Let's come back to those core principles. And it was a real thrill yesterday when Matt and Indu, thank you so much, said, acknowledged that Unmentionables is really gaining some traction, right? There were some amazing apps that people showed today, financial stress, caregiving stress. So this is beginning to work. But one of the things that we wanted to say is if you're looking to check the Unmentionables box, just broadening the definition of health to include life is not enough. It is not enough to just have a financial stress app up on your website or someplace, a logo that someone can click on if they're a caregiver. And why is that not enough? It's not enough because we have to design for reality. And remember that those who are most in need often most lack the capacity to go get help. So if all we're doing is sitting back, pass back passively, feeling good about ourselves because, oh, look, now I have all these life apps, it's not going to help the caregiver or the person who's got financial stress or who just lost their job or is going through a divorce because they don't have the energy, the wherewithal to go out and find these solutions. So what we actually have to do is go out and find them, stand up, go find people, meet them where they are with what they might not have known how to ask for. And I just don't think there's a group that is better equipped to do that than this one remembering that health is life, care completely, and empathy always. So Joan, we had a theme song through this process. I don't know if any of you guys like Train. I think they're local. Um, but their song, Bruises, which, which remind us as we go through this process um, that that's what makes us beautiful, right? It is as we go through these horribly debilitating, um, really gut-wrenching experiences that we become ultimately who we are. And as the healthcare industry, may we do a much better job supporting people as they go through that process so we can help them get to a better and happier place. Thank you guys very much for sticking with us. I know we just went through so much stuff, and I'm incredibly grateful, um, obviously, to all the panelists. So thank you, and I think we can go drink. Funny enough. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Make for